And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Chef Canarsi. Yo, Lord Willen, Jeff Canarsi, Mob Talk Radio. Check it out. Yo, we stay quiet like Russell Buffalino when things will get ugly like Pessy's death in Casino. Who do we know? No one, nobody. But we're all well respected like Della Croce and Gotti. I know wild nights, a van and not turn. Light up a cigar and watch the spot burn. You'll get patty whacked, I'm tough like Irish dock workers. Run with guys with guys, hooligans and black lurkers. Corner berserkers, street savvy soldiers. You owe, you better pay. Don't make me say I told you. Cold you don't betray, I say what I mean. Providence and Brooklyn all the way to the bean. I'd rather be unseen like Vinny the Chin. I don't gotta go to Vegas to see cities of sin. Pull the pin, drop bombs like Danny Green I write homicide like the murder machine Lansky, Luciano, mastermind the racket Up in the clam house with a million in my jacket Move around when the streets get darker Pay homage to real bosses like Gambino and Patriarcha Mob talking, but you don't talk to the mob Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi, we stay on our job This is Mob Talk, straight from the streets Mob Talk, the life over beats Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi, bringing you the real Kill all rats you already know the deal. This is mob talk, straight from the streets. Mob talk, the life of a beats. Lord Will and Jeff Canarsi bringing you the real. Kill all rats. You already know the deal. And welcome to Mob Talk Radio. I am your host Jeff Canarsi, and we are back. It's been a crazy week and a half, obviously. Uh, when I time these fucking breaks, I, I don't realize that somebody like Whitey Bulger is going to get his fucking head caved in. Uh, but we're going to get to that today. And I wanted to preface all of that by saying this is not going to be a Whitey Bulger biography. We're going to specifically talk about what happened to Whitey uh, and just sort of digress and, and go into the, the... There's a lot of conspiracy theories that are going around. A lot of people are pointing the finger at this guy, that guy. Uh, a lot of people are saying the FBI was in on it. Then they're going to say Kevin Weeks isn't a rat. And when is Steve Lemmy going to get his head kicked in? So there's a lot of stuff going around. So what I'm going to try to do is unblur those lines today uh, and only the way that I do. Uh, I do want to state right off the bat, I don't give a fuck that Bulger's dead. I think he got what he deserved. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it there with that. Now, <coughs> the, excuse me. The other thing, uh, obviously, we did take a week off and. Uh, I was at the fight, uh, and let me let me tell you this about John Gotti the Third. This kid's going to be a star. Uh, seeing it on, you know, seeing replays of the, the the prior two fights do not give what this kid can do justice. He's insanely tough. He's incredibly quick, and that kid's going to be something in MMA. Let me tell you, absolutely. And this isn't me just being jaded because I'm a fan or I have friends or whatever. This is legitimately the kid. The kid is a tough kid. Uh, and as his career sort of moves forward, you know, we're going to definitely uh, keep a sharp eye on that. Uh, but you can tell, and, and this is something I, I want to hit home for those that weren't there. And there were a lot of you that did come out, and, and I'll get sort of to that in a minute. But I wanted to be really clear. Uh, John Gotti the third. it's very apparent to me uh, that this kid not only has his grandfather's heart, but he has his father's heart. And this is a kid that's going to do things. Uh, you can just tell. There's certain fighters, and, and I know MMA is, MMA is mixed martial arts and all of that, but I've seen, I've been watching fighting my whole life, be it boxing, be it other things like that. And every once in a while, somebody comes along, and you can see something in them that just tells you they're going to be at the very top of what they do. And this kid's got all the markings of it. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to say that the last name recognition and all of that, but I think, and I don't know John Guy the third, obviously I don't know him at all, <clears throat> but I think it is safe to say that this kid is driven. Uh, he has got that gaudy thing. And, and I, I, I don't know how I can really parlay that or, or explain it on the radio to you. You just, it's something you have to see for yourself. Uh, John Gotti, uh, senior was, uh, it, it's, I'm trying to find the right words to say it, but everything that you think about him as far as swagger and everything about his personality, uh, when he walks in the room, you know, everybody is uh, on attention and they're looking at him. It, it's like a star-like kind of quality to it. And that's the only way I can kind of get it across. 
But this is a Gotti trait. This isn't just something that John Gotti Sr. had. Uh, Peter Gotti has it. Uh, John Gotti Jr. has it. John Gotti III has it. It's a Gotti trait. Uh, how they carry themselves and, and how they how it sort of manifests in a way. They they have a way of, especially John Gotti Jr., has a way of, when he speaks to you, making you feel like you're the most important person in the room. Fuck everybody else. I'm talking to you. Peter, I met Peter for the first time at the fight. He's a great guy. Very, very nice. And I think that there is a serious line that is blurred between what people think in these sickening chat rooms and what people say. Uh, if you have never, ever, ever, ever met John Gotti Jr., if you've never met Peter Gotti, or even Angel Gotti for that matter, you just don't understand. You can go by what the press says, you can go by what rats say, but the truth is they're very, very warm, loving, family-oriented, highly respectful people. Uh, they made me feel like a fucking star all weekend, uh, and I was just trying to merely go see the fight and just hang out with, with my attorney, Elio, and, and meet a lot of the people that came in for the fight. Uh, and so one of the things I wanted to kind of say, and I don't want to like keep going back and forth on it, but uh, John Gotti III as a fighter is going to be a star. He's very humble. He's very dedicated. He's very driven. And I haven't seen that in a fighter in a long time. And I think this kid's got all the ear markings. He's going to be a huge star. Uh, and I can't wait to see what he does next. I believe his next fight, I don't know when the date will be, but I'm, I'm hearing it's going to be uh, in New York. So not everybody will have to travel to Rhode Island to do it. But I wanted to talk about Rhode Island for just a, a quick second. Uh, while I was there, I met a lot of people that listen to my radio show. People I don't even honestly fucking know. Uh, came up to me, bought me drinks. Eric, you shit, you bought me too many drinks that night. Eric was buying drinks for everybody. He's a great guy. He came in for the fight. I met a lot of guys from Springfield. Uh, the guy that did the intro to my rap song, Chris, uh, was there. Got to sit down and talk with him and hang out for a while. All good people. Uh, but one of the things that I found that was truly interesting was sitting in, I think we were in the second row, ringside. Uh, John Gotti Jr. continuously, prior to his son fighting, kept coming over to make sure that everybody there had what they wanted. Do you need anything? Can I get you anything? Everybody comfortable? This is a guy whose kid is about to fight, and I'm sure that's not an easy thing as a parent to deal with. Your kid's about to fight. You know, he's got a million things he's worried about, but his focus was on making sure that everybody was happy. And that's like, I, I cannot say enough about how that makes you sort of feel because he put whatever stress or whatever nervousness he had on the table over here. Let me deal with them, make sure everybody's happy and content. If they need anything, I'll take care of it. Uh, he just knows how to take care of people. He was very generous with his time, very generous, generous with his time with me, uh, and I had a great time. It was a lot of fun. Now, as far as a lot of people coming up to me at the fight, uh, I didn't know who half these fucking people were. I, I really didn't. Uh, and it's one of those things where I'm not completely comfortable being the highlight of anything. Like, I just kind of like to do my thing, sit there, drink a beer, do just, you know, just be a regular guy. But I wasn't really able to be a regular guy. There was a lot of people that came up, wanted photos, wanted all this and that. And listen, I'm very grateful for it. It was just a weird experience. I'm not used to being... It's not like a popular thing. It's just like I'm not used to being anybody's focal point like that. I kind of like to do my own thing. But for those of you I did meet, I was glad to meet everybody. Uh, I'm glad you guys liked the show. Uh, and it just sort of, I guess, people, and, and and I guess people that do know me and have met me now will, will come out and tell you that who I am and, and what I'm like in person. Same guy, excuse me, same guy you're hearing here. Not much difference, just not as loud and abrasive. Uh, but all in all, John Gotti Jr. Uh, knows how to throw a hell of a party in the, uh, in Rhode Island. It's a great fight. And anybody who missed out on this fight that's from New York didn't get a chance to go, make sure that when he fights here in Long Island in the next couple months, get out and go. You, it, it's definitely uh, a party you need to attend. It, it really is. The Gottis will make you feel welcome. They're warm people. They're good people. And that's the misnomer that I think the public doesn't get because not everybody gets an opportunity to be John Jr.'s friend. Not everybody gets an opportunity to, to have a conversation with him. 
Uh, I made sure that some people that did come out to see me got introduced to him. And I think that he surprises a lot of people because he's a very intelligent guy. He's no dummy by any stretch of the imagination. He's very humble. Uh, and I think that it surprises people that he is so receptive and warm to people that, that he doesn't even know. Uh, it's just, it's the Gotti gene. They're all, all like that. Uh, Angel especially. Uh, I can't say enough good about her. Uh, but Peter is the same way. Very warm. Uh, and John Jr. is very warm. They're good people. And I think that people have a tendency to read what they read the bullshit papers, listen to the gossip, and they don't have the opportunity to say, like, meet somebody like that. And so they sort of listen to what everybody else says. But I'm telling you, as God is my witness, they're good people, fantastic people. I can't say enough good about them. Uh, but that, that's my experience. Maybe there's people that didn't have some experience like that. But I'm telling you, they're good people. They're warm people. You couldn't ask for a better ally. You couldn't ask for better friends. Uh, they would do anything for, like, anybody. They're, they're not what these rats keep telling you. All right, so all that being said, uh, do yourself a favor. Uh, definitely check out John Gotti the Third next time he fights. Go out and see it. Uh, definitely worth the money. Rhode Island was a great time. Everybody left happy, obviously, because, you know, the fight was very quick uh, because John Gotti the Third doesn't fuck around when it comes to that. Uh, you know, and he's a great fighter. And I think, I think in general, the more that, I think people are able to go out and experience that type of situation uh, and see the Gaudis for really who they are at the end of the day uh, and not what the press says. I, you're going to be very surprised. I know that a lot of people that did come out, mainly because you know they wanted to see the fight, but they wanted to meet me and all of that, they were very surprised that John, specifically John, was so friendly and warm to people he didn't even know. But this, like I told you, this is the Gaudi gene. This is who they are. This isn't like some figmented fucking reality or some figmented drama I'm making up to you. I'm telling you literally from my heart, these are good people. Uh, and, and I would not be around people if they weren't good. That's the bottom line. Uh, that's the way it's always been. So people don't have to listen to me. They can, you know, be decisive and make their own decisions, but I have a duty to, sort of implore people to stop listening to the nonsense, stop listening to the lies that are being told. If you don't know them, shut the fuck up. Because unless you know them, unless you've been around them, unless you've experienced a conversation with them, uh, because everybody knows I'm very close with Angel. Very, 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 very close. Uh, and so unless you know them, you really don't. You, you don't know what they're like. But I'm telling you, just stop with the nonsense. Stop listening to what people who have never met them, never been around them say. It's very easy to like pick up an article and run your fucking yap about somebody and not know them. It's easy to do that. And I think the ones that do this definitely wouldn't have the courage to walk up to them and say half the shit they do. Uh, and that's just the reality. But they're great people. I had a great time. I was made to feel like I was part of the family. And I, you know, I cannot say enough good about that. So when John Gotti the third fights here in uh, Long Island, everybody should come out, support him, e support the fighter, support him as a, as a a kid who is going places. Uh, you don't have to be a Gotti fan; you could be an MMA fan. Uh, the kid's an incredible fighter, and I cannot wait to see what he does next. So, all that being said, I'm going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to get into the Q and A. Uh, and then after the Q&A, we're going to get into Bulger. But like I said, if you're expecting some sort of biography, it's not going to be that way. It's going to be very specific about what happened. And I'm going to like try to blur the lines a little bit for you to make it easier. Well, I'm, obviously, I'm not blurring the fucking lines. But I'm going to try to format it in a way uh, that's sort of street so you can understand uh, exactly why things like this happen and why we can't point the finger at the FBI, why we can't point the finger at... Uh, all these ghosts in the closet because that's what people are doing there, there's not a lot of reality in some of the conversations i'm seeing and i'm going to get into some of the sick shit i have seen uh, where people are upset that he got killed and listen live by the gun die by the gun that's how gangsters live that's how they always will live uh there is a silent justice in prison that goes on everybody knows that uh, i was completely amazed that a lot of people didn't know what a slock was uh, but anyway, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to get into the Q&A. And then we will get into Bulger. And I think coming off the break, I'm going to talk about the new website. 
because uh, there's something coming with that. So stay tuned. We will be right back. In my travels, I'm always looking for a clothing brand that I feel like represents me. Anybody can go to a store and buy a t-shirt with a gimmick. But if you believe in three core values like I do, loyalty, honor, and respect, then look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. You can catch them at omertamia.com, O-M-E-R-T-A. MIA.com with locations in Europe, California, Boston, Brooklyn, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Washington. They have a great clothing line with hats, shirts, sweatshirts, keychains, anything you might need, stickers. You want the rats to stop snitching? Go right out and get yourself a sticker. But if you want to live your life by the gentleman's code, look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. Hey, welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to get into the Q&A, but before I do that, I wanted to kind of talk about the web page for a minute. Uh, obviously, I, I don't want to get into like my battle with YouTube right now. There, there's a battle going on on YouTube, and I, I just I'm fed up with fucking YouTube. Uh, and so I am going to be moving forward with the new page. Uh, the new page is going to have the blog. It's going to have videos, mini documentaries, uh, and all the radio shows that you're hearing now will be over on that now a lot of people have asked me are you going to continue to do youtube uh prior to like last week i was absolutely going to do a couple of things on youtube uh once a month or once every two months just to kind of keep the youtube channel going but with the issue that i'm having with youtube now i'm going to have to leave youtube Uh, all the old shows will remain there Uh, i may do like some live stuff uh on youtube but for the most part i think everything's going to be over on the new site now when is the new site coming that seems to be the big question that I continue to get. Right now, I couldn't tell you an exact date. It's going to be in January. Uh, I'm probably, my, my partner Scott is coming over from England for about a week, and I sort of want to time the release of that when he comes because I, he's going to be involved in the page as well. Uh, you're going to get uh, his some of his radio shows as well, as well as, there's going to be, I think, three radio shows you're going to get. Uh, it's going to be $4 a month, uh, and that's, it shouldn't budge anywhere higher than that. Uh, as we get closer and closer, uh, to January, obviously I'm going to put a lot more out about exactly what the page is going to entail. But right now I, I'm sort of working on it like everybody else. Uh, I'm sort of picking and choosing sort of what I want the theme to be, where I want to go, but you are going to get the mob talk show. You are going to get Scott show. Uh, you're going to get a, a, another radio show on top of it, which is going to be sort of crime related, but a little different. Uh, and you're definitely going to get, you know, uh, live shows, call ins, all of that, all of that crap that everybody's been asking me is going to happen. I just have to, you know, really sit down and, and just really plan everything out. I, I've got a huge folder, like a sort of a map of what I want to do. But this stuff takes time. And I want to make sure that people are getting the biggest bang for their buck that I can give them. Uh, This is not about getting rich by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not going to get rich off this. This is not a wealthy genre, Uh, but I have to do something to control my overhead. And then that's the bottom line. Uh, What I do, anybody that thinks that this is easy, anybody that thinks that I don't work long hours doing this is out of their minds. Uh, This takes a lot of work. Uh, This is 24-7 of my life, and and there have been people in the past that said, oh, no, he just sits down for 10 minutes. Listen. If this was a 10-minute project, I'd have 450 shows by now. This is a, every show is a 5 to 10-hour fucking ordeal for me. It's just, it's research, it's editing, it's it's a lot of stuff. So anybody that thinks this is easy, you know, it, it, if it is, you go ahead and you do it. You deal with the 500 messages a day from people that you can't keep up with. You deal with the, the, the fucking haters who send you death threats and say all kinds of crazy shit. If you want to deal with that, go right a fucking head. Uh, but all that being said, uh, that's sort of where we're going to head with that. But as we get closer to like, I'd say the middle of December, I'm going to start releasing a little bit more just so people can understand, uh, what exactly we're going to be doing, uh, and more. And, and as we get further down the line, we'll, we'll talk more about the Flanagan's, uh, my TV show, which will be in production in the spring, uh, in Boston and in Providence. I, I don't want to go into all of that right now. That That's going to be a whole entire sort of show in and of itself. I'm going to have somebody uh, on the radio show that is involved in the project and, and will have a lot more to say than I will about it. Uh, and I think that would be a, a pretty entertaining show in and of itself. Okay, so we got a lot of questions, obviously. Per the usual, 
uh, I cannot answer every single question. Uh, and I do appreciate the fact that everybody, you know, takes time to send me messages and, and, and wants to have questions answered. And I get a lot of the same questions all the time. But I still will answer them as much as I can. And if I didn't get to your question, it's simply because your question involves way too much information. And I try to make everything as in depth as I can, but I, I can't spend 10 minutes on each question. Otherwise, you know, we're never going to get to the fucking point. So all that, we're going to begin with the Q&A. The first question I got was, who was more Cosa Nostra, John Gotti or Nino Gaggi? John Gotti. Listen, John Gotti wore... Regardless of what you think about John Gotti Sr., a lot of people have a lot of different opinions, but the one thing you can't take away from the guy was he was straight street gangster. They don't make him like that anymore. It's a rare quality to have. Uh, I mean, I think both Nino and John Gotti were both gangsters. They both wore it incredibly well. Uh, maybe John Gotti gets it because he's a little more prolific. Some some would say that that's a, that's a downfall uh, for him. Uh, but rather than get into all that, I, I listen, you're not going to find a, a bigger gangster than John Gotti. John Gotti was more gangster than Al Capone could ever hope to be. And that that's the straight truth to it. All right. What is the most intriguing time period of the mob and what family interests you the most? Ah, Philadelphia, for some reason, uh, I think in the 70s and 60s is very interesting to me. Uh, Philadelphia just has such a dichotomy and just... I don't want to, I'm trying to figure out how to say it. Philadelphia has its own sort of thing to it. I, I But of all the families that interest me the most, uh, whew, probably the Genoveses, only because that time period of when the chin takes over to his Looney Tunes act walking down the street like he's a fucking retard pissing himself, to me that's interesting. And I think that the 1960s in general, uh, right before the 68, 69, when you sort of had the turn, uh, the 60s definitely, I think, were the most interesting time period for the mob. It, it was a time when they owned politics. And when and I think that's what interests me is the, the, the political side to this, like your friend Costello's and stuff like that, because that's when the mob truly would have been feared the most. When you control politics, you control power, you control cops. Uh, to me, that's the most interesting thing. And I think the Genovese's, Especially specifically when you you, you got Tony Salerno and, and Vinny the Chin working together, uh, to me that's completely interesting. Uh, I'm not so interested. I, I mean, I'm interested in what goes on in today's time period, but I think anything that that we would consider a throwback uh, to me, just because of the politics that are involved in it and just the scheming and and just the historical events, I, to me that's just. Uh, that's more entertaining. I'm not interested in the 20s and 30s whatsoever because that was sort of more of, uh, you know, Bonnie and Clyde type of shit, drive-by type of shit. And and while that's entertaining to me, I just think the 60s really for me, the Kennedys, uh, Giancana, and just Sinatra, just, to me, that's my favorite time period. All right, is it possible Whitey Bulger didn't rat at all, but rather Conley being a childhood friend essentially made up all his cooperation to keep him out of his prison as long as he could? Uh, absolutely not. Whitey Bulger is a fucking rat. Don't get it twisted. I don't want to go any further than that, only because we're going to talk about that situation. But uh, John, listen, John Conley was an FBI agent. He was a childhood friend of Whitey's. He covered his ass. Just looking at the 302s in and of themselves, uh, the FBI should have been tipped off way prior that John Conley was, was weighing over his head because... 302s, listen, are not like three sentences. 302s are hundreds of pages of debriefings and, and criminal acts that are highly detailed. And the majority of Whitey Bulger's 302s were one-line sentences. And if you go through the 302s, the same fucking things were said time and time again. Page one, it was blah, blah, blah. Page 486, same exact thing, blah, blah, blah. So Connolly was was doctoring 302s. Not this is why I don't want to go down this hole now. We'll come back to that because anybody who has seen the film, the documentary, The United States of America versus James Whitey Bulger, has this opinion that Whitey Bulger wasn't a rat, and, and it's because of the way the documentary was shot, and it has to do with 302s. And we'll get there. I just give me a little uh, time, okay. The Gemini Twins, prison sentence. I take it it's life without parole? Absolutely. Uh, Anthony Center and Joey Testa, were n are, they're never going to get out of prison. They're going to die there. That's just, 
That's just the reality of it. All right. How was Peter Savino able to get so close to Vincent the Chin? He wasn't a made guy. He wasn't even a made guy. Then when Gas Pipe repeatedly tells him he was a cooperator, he refused to believe it. Any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question uh, because Vincent the Chin was a smart guy. Uh, and why didn't Vinny the Chin believe Gas Pipe when Gas Pipe, Gas Pipe goes to him and says, listen, Pete Savino, he's a fucking rat. Got to be careful. Uh, and I think the reason why Vinny the Chin probably didn't listen to it was because Gas Pipe was a loose fucking cannon. You got to remember, Gas Pipe and the Mafia cops, everything Gas Pipe did, didn't, he didn't think shit through. He just, he fucking reacted most of his life when it came to stuff. Uh, and I, maybe it's not because Vinny the Chin didn't buy it, but he also knew that Gas Pipe was getting information from cops and it probably didn't sit well with him that Gas Pipe was dealing with cops. As a matter of fact, I would almost say for 100% certain that Vinny the Chin didn't like the fact that Gas Pipe was dealing with cops. You know, there's a long-standing rule that, that ex-cops couldn't be in the mafia. We've seen this before in Philadelphia with Ron Preverty, that fat fuck. Uh, people were asking me to do the, the Ron Preverty voice, so I think that's all you're going to get for today. Ah, yeah, Joey Marino, I'm a fat pig. I can't swallow. I'm still bookmaking in South Philly. That's how he talked, so I, I told everybody I would do it, so there you go. You get your Ron Previty for today. I look like Jabba the fucking hut and George Anastasia. All right, all right. All that being said, if you look at Philadelphia in that time period, they allowed Ron Previty to kind of to get involved, which was a bad mistake. He was a bad cop, and ultimately he was a fucking fat rat. So uh, I think any time that you allow ex— that was the mob rule. You just cop ex-cops weren't allowed to be involved. Uh, and you see as a result what has happened over time with situations like that. And so that's why I think Vinny the Chin probably realistically uh, just didn't want any sort of like involvement in the whole thing. Uh, and that's probably why he didn't believe that. I don't, I don't listen. It's not that he didn't believe that Pete Servino wasn't talking. I, I think he probably aligned himself with the idea that it was. But this is also coming from Gas Pipe was a little reckless with his mouth and also incredibly reckless by bringing people around. And so that's probably realistically uh, why he didn't all right how come steve flemmy hasn't had his head bashed in yet is he in pc yes he is in protective custody steve flemmy is definitely in protective custody uh why hasn't he had his head bashed in yet well he hasn't been transferred to hazelton <laughs> so if he gets transferred to hazelton that's probably what will happen all right uh as far as size, was the Winter Hill Gang as big as any mob families? Absolutely not. Uh, their numbers weren't that big. They had a lot of associates, a lot of tight-knit guys. Uh, I can't give you an exact number. I could probably guess it's probably between 20 to 35, but no, not definitely not as big as any mob families whatsoever. However, they were a tight-knit group, and they were also very ruthless, uh, probably as probably more ruthless than the Westies. I didn't think that was possible, but I, I think reality is is that... Uh, they were. Uh, is there any contracts on Johnny Monerano or Kevin Weeks for ratting on a rat? Okay, I guess I'm going to have to talk about that now. Listen, uh, Wh Whitey Bulger ratted out a bunch of people. This we know, okay? Uh, Kevin Weeks turns a rat and John Monerano turns a rat because they say that Whitey Bulger is a rat. Just because a rat is a rat doesn't give you the fucking re doesn't give you the right to rat yourself. Kevin Weeks is just as much a fucking rat as Whitey Bulger. Uh, John Mortarano is a rat just as big as Kevin Weeks and Whitey Bulger. A lot of people seem to blur this line and say, well, Kevin Weeks wasn't a rat. Whitey Bulger fucking betrayed him, and so that gives him the right. It doesn't give you the right. What the fuck gives Kevin Weeks the fucking right to put other people in prison? If he was just going to go after Whitey Bulger, that's one thing. All right, an eye for an eye. I get that. But Kevin Weeks put other people in prison. So you can't make that argument with me. They did crimes together. So if Whitey rats him out, guess what? Kill Whitey. Go kill him. Why didn't you kill him? Well, he didn't find out till after the fact. Okay, so you mean to tell me that it's acceptable for Kevin Weeks after he knows he's going to go to prison, which he don't want to do because Whitey's talking about him, that he's going to put somebody else in prison? Like, seriously, come on. So the argument that Kevin Weeks isn't a rat, he is a rat. He's an informant, just like fucking John Mortarano, 
who seems to think that he's not a rat, but a government witness. You're a fucking rat. You're a rat. You put other people in fucking prison. Both of them did. Uh, it doesn't make it right. Just because somebody fucking tells on you does not give you the right to go tell on somebody else. If you're going to tell on the guy that tells on you, that's one thing. But the guy that tells on you, all right, deal with him. But you're going to put somebody else in? So there's there's no oil. These guys aren't oil. When, and I've said this a hundred fucking times, and I'll say it till I'm fucking face down in the gutter with two in the back of my head, is that if you get into a car with four other guys wearing ski masks and have guns, you know what you're getting involved in. So you get caught. You don't want to go to prison. So you're going to tell on everybody. That's what a rat is. And that's what Kevin Weeks did. And that's what fucking John Monerano did. I don't give a fuck that Whitey ratted them out. A rat is a rat is a rat. But that doesn't give them the right to put another guy who's not remotely involved in that crew or that situation in jail. And that's what Kevin Weeks did. It doesn't make... It just... I don't understand why people don't get that. Uh, just like I don't understand why people were upset that Whitey Bulger got killed. He's a fucking rat. He fucking... Forget about... he. You know what... Whitey Bulger brought so much heroin into Southie. He fucking destroyed Southie. He killed women. This is not what mob guys do. They don't kill women. Drugs, it is what it is. But it's like you don't know how many lives Whitey Bulger fucking ruined. And they said, oh, uh, how, how tough is somebody who, who kills an 89-year-old man? And my response is this, and people are not going to like my response. First thing is, he got what he fucking deserved. That's the first thing. Second thing is, how how easy do you think it is to, to fling a slock, which is a padlock in a sock used as a weapon to kill somebody? How difficult do you think, how easy do you think it is to hurl that motherfucker 70 times in about two minutes? Then on top of it, you're out of breath and you're going to try to cut the guy's eyes out and his tongue out. That's not an easy thing. You gotta have stamina to do that. It's not easy. I know that's a fucking awful thing to say. He got what he deserved. Bottom fucking line. And I'm gonna get more into that. Uh, but as far as there being a contract on Johnny Motorano or Kevin Weeks, listen, Kevin Weeks is walking the streets of Southie. He's not afraid of anybody. But shit has a way of coming back. So a contract? Not really. Listen, I don't think the Italian mob gives a fuck about either one of those guys. Uh, but I think the reality is, when you do that kind of shit, as we see in the Whitey Bulger situation, it comes back to bite you in the ass. Or in Whitey's case, his uh, dented fucking skull. All right, any progress on Carmine per Persico's release? His attorney is still working on the case. They're still trying to get him out. Uh, we, we've talked about that a lot on this show. I, I think, you know, Carmine's down in Butner, North Carolina. I heard that he's wheelchair bound going blind. Uh, he was, he was convicted for being something that he wasn't at the time. Uh, listen, he mobster, absolutely not going to argue, not going to like sort of flower that up any other way that, that shouldn't be. Uh, but he was convicted under a, a, a Rico statute and he was convicted of being the boss when in fact he technically at the time wasn't same shit happened to Tony Salerno uh and they're what they're trying to do is you know the guy's in his 80s uh he's not gonna this is not gonna be another Sonny Francis that lives to 101 or whatever it is so his attorney is still working on it uh his last attempt at taking care of this the judge didn't want to hear so I'm sure that they're going to keep trying but as far as I know you know it, it still is where it is he's still in prison in Butner. Uh, and hopefully they can get him out. I, you know, the guy's done a shitload of time, uh, and I just think it's time. All right. Baltimore have any factions? Okay, I get this question a lot. So there must be a lot of Baltimore people. Uh, Baltimore had organized crime. Not so much anymore, but they did from the 1920s till about the 1990s. Uh, originally, Baltimore was sort of an independent faction until Vincent Mangano put in uh, Louis Marici in charge. Uh, Marici was a captain and what would later become the Gambino crime family. Uh, the Gambinos have periodically been the organization that has been there uh, 
Most of Baltimore's existence mafia-wise uh, was through the Corby brothers, Vito, Pasquale, and Frank. You can go ahead and look up the Corby brothers. We've talked about them before. Uh, but at full power, they had around 10 main guys and around 40 associates. Uh, they were involved in drugs, extortion, prostitution, loan shark and gamble and fraud, murder and political corruption. Uh, from 1900 till about 1923, Vincent D'Urso was the boss. From 23 to 29, Vito Corby. 29 to 55, Pasquale Corby. Uh, from 55 to 68, Louis Marici. Uh, and then from 68 to 1990, Frank Corby ran things. And you can look up all that information uh, for yourself. The, the Corby brothers were a very interesting group of guys. Uh, but Baltimore being sort of a hub of a lot of different things, especially outside of D.C. Somebody once asked me, how come the mafia is not in D.C.? And I say, with the NSA, the CIA, the FBI being there, are you fucking out of your mind? That's like, it just, you know, doesn't make any sense. It's not to say that I know that there's a lot of Greek mafia there. Uh, in D.C., especially in Alexandria area. And we're going to cover the Greek mob at, at some point. There's there's some very interesting things that I think there's some parallels. And, and I like to look at the structure of different ethnic organized crime groups because there's a lot of subtle differences. And the Greeks are nobody to fuck around with, let me tell you. Uh, but as far as Baltimore goes, that's pretty much it. Frank Corby, uh, look up the Corby brothers. But the Gambinos have always sort of been uh, the the faction that was there. <clears throat> okay. Jewish organized crime in Baltimore. Little Melvin Williams was supposed to be connected with a guy in Lansky's organization. Is that true? And any, any information? Absolutely true. Uh, Melvin Williams, if you don't know who he was, he was a drug trafficker in West Baltimore. And he sort of comes to infamy in the 1960s in Baltimore prior to becoming uh, a huge narcotics trafficker. He was a pool hall hustler, a, a dice game guy, a policy guy, as far as, the numbers racket, uh, he was involved, like I said, with the numbers racket, and he learned that business uh, from a guy named Julius Salisbury, who was born in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, his family relocated to Baltimore. He was a Jewish gangster, but not in the terms of Lucky or Meyer Lansky. He was not a violent guy whatsoever. Uh, he was a policy guy, and he was a gambling guru, uh, and that's uh, really the partnership sort of came in because uh, Julius Salisbury would actually pay uh, Williams to drive to New York City, to Brooklyn specifically, to drop off percentages of Salisbury's numbers racket. Once a week, it would go to the Gambino crime family, and Williams would drop off the payoff. And that's really how Williams sort of got aligned with the mob in general. But I think a lot has been made out of a relationship there that really wasn't uh, – a relationship. Uh, eventually, Williams goes into the drug game, and he makes close alliances with Frank Matthews, obviously, who we've talked about on this show before. Uh, but that's really uh, Melvin Williams' only foray into to organized crime is through Julius Salisbury, who had connections with, obviously, the Gambinos and Meyer Lansky. Uh, Salisbury, if you look into him, if you've never heard of this guy, look into him. He was a nightclub owner, he was a fucking gambling kingpin, but he was very, very non-violent, violent, and he really wasn't a mobster either. Uh, he was just a racketeer, uh, just a racketeer. Uh, and that's really only, that's really the only connection between Melvin Williams uh, and the mob right there. All right. Um, do you think the FBI put an incapacitated bulger in prison to be killed for knowing too much? Uh, and to prevent deathbed confessions out of or outing high-level FBI agents. Listen, uh, I don't let let me let me skip that and come back to that. Uh, I think the short answer to that uh, is that we got to stop believing conspiracy theories. We got to stop believing conspiracy theories. Uh, but I I want to talk about Bulger in a different sense, so we'll come back to that one. All right, did the families of New York really put the Bruno? hit into into action or was it his own consigliere uh caponegro and was it over casinos this seems to be a question i get a lot we've talked about it a lot i, I think that there people seem to forget first of all we got to talk about angelo bruno in a sense uh angelo bruno had this thing where he didn't want anybody selling drugs he didn't want his guys selling drugs or getting into the drug game however he allowed in his territory Gambino's to do it and that's a big problem and they were Carlo Gambino's cousins uh, Rosario Gambino specifically uh, if you're going to tell your guys 
You can't sell drugs. You can't make money off of drugs. But then you allow another crime family to come into your fucking turf to make money and you're going to take a kickback from it. That's a very hypocritical thing to do. You can't fucking tell your guys you're going to starve, but I'm going to let another family come in here and sell drugs. Uh, it, 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 under Bruno, his guys were starving. Uh, Anthony Caponegro wanted things for himself. And the way that this sort of, and I don't want to get down a rabbit trail, but uh, the Genovese's, Vinny the Chin, specifically, I, and I don't, I'm not going to say completely, but but Vinny the Chin had more to do with that than anybody's ever going to know. Uh, and and I've talked about it at length, and and, and how it all went down. Uh, you can't you can't tell me for one second John Stanfield wasn't in on in on that. He was sitting in the goddamn car when Bruno gets hit, and not a scratch. Listen, that's a hit that goes down that everybody dies in the car. The fact that Stanfield wasn't even touched tells me he was in on it, knew it was going to happen. Uh, the reason why it happened has a lot to do with Atlantic City. The reason why it happened has a lot to do with money. Uh, guys were starving. Guys wanted to to sell drugs. Guys wanted to make huge profits, and Bruno wasn't going to allow them to do that. But then he was going to allow the Gambinos to do what they wanted in his own territory, and it sort of became a uh, kill-or-be-killed type of situation. Guys wanted to fucking earn. I mean, put yourself... Let's pretend for a second that you're a street guy. You're trying to make ends meet the best way you know how. The quickest way to make money is drugs. That's reality. Uh, the biggest bang for your buck, uh, a lot of money involved, and the guy that runs the family is going to tell you you can't earn. You can't earn that way, but then he's on the side going to take profits from another family, and they're going to sell drugs in your area. It just it didn't sit well with anybody. It didn't sit well with anybody, and ultimately, Cap and Negro goes to move on him. And he did it thinking that he had permission to do it because he was lied to. He was lied to. Excuse me. He was lied to. He was he was led to believe it was acceptable. He goes and he does it. Then he is fucking sh gets the shock of his fucking life when he goes to New York and he's told, I never gave you permission to do that when he was. And he's executed as a result. And that was a setup by Funzy Thierry that goes back years. They had a they had a beef for years over rackets and other things. And ultimately it would pave the way for Nikki Scarfo, which was a fucking epic mistake. Uh but I I have always believed and I will always believe that the Chin didn't orchestrate it, but he didn't exactly go, No, don't do that. It's sort of like off the cuff. Go ahead, go ahead and do it, because there was money involved. Uh, and I think that the reality is uh, that that the Bruno hit was put in motion by New York, but when it came down to the ramifications, that's why they, they immediately killed Cap and Negro. Nope, eye for an eye. He shouldn't have done that. We didn't say he could do that. We're going to kill him because there was a huge argument where Cap and Negro says, listen, you okayed this. You told me it was all right. I never said nothing. So there you go. It was just a setup. It was just a setup. And then Funzy Thierry goes right into fucking Caponegro's territory and takes rackets back. So it was a money grab. Uh, but Bruno got hit really because of, of money at the end of the day. Uh, and I'm not trying to say anything nasty or derogatory uh, about Angelo Bruno. But the fact is, if you pinch the quarter till the eagle screams, eventually somebody's going to use a fucking hammer. And that's the reality of it. That's the reality of it. Set up from beginning to end. All right. Uh, do you have any information about the couple uh, that they did two movies about Rob the Mob? Was there really a couple that robbed mob social clubs in the early 90s? Absolutely. And I could tell you some personal stories. I, I don't know. I don't know who. I never knew Tom Uva. But I have heard some crazy fucking stories from people that did know him and did grow up with him. And Tommy Uva was a fucking nutcase from childhood to his early 20s until they were both killed. Uh, what it was was Rosemary and Tommy Uva together. Uh, first of all, they were drug addicts. You have to understand that. So a lot of these robberies that they did, and it wasn't just mob social clubs. They robbed banks as well. Uh, they would do this because they needed to get their fucking fix. Uh, and what they ended up doing was robbing mob social clubs that were gambling and et cetera. They'd walk in with the machine gun. They'd take all the fucking money. Uh, and like I said, they were drug addicts. Uh, Tommy himself was a fucking psychopath from like the age of fucking 10. 
Uh, he was in trouble with the law his entire life. Guys that grew up with him that I've had the, the pleasure of sitting down and talking to have told me some of the most disturbing fucking stories about this guy, Tommy. He was a fucking mob fan. Uh, he wanted to be a gangster as a kid. He robbed gas stations as a kid. I, I, guess, I think it was a gas station like literally like across the street from his house. He walked in with a fucking pistol at like age 11 and robbed him. So this was a guy that, that was a psychopath from day one. Uh, in 1992, uh, Rosemary and Tommy Uva were sitting, I believe it was like right around Christmas time. They were sitting, uh, in a car, uh, near Ozone Park and they were shot several times in the head, uh, obviously killed sitting at a traffic light. Uh, according to the, the FBI, which take it as you want, uh, a captain in the Gambinos by the name of Dominic Skinny Dom Pizzoni, uh, excuse me. Pizzonia was the shooter in that, but it was never proven. Uh, allegedly, John Gotti was caught on a wiretap saying that they took care of the Rosemary and, and Tommy Uva. They that they killed him. A lot of people over time, a lot of people have said that Vinny Basquiano did it. So there's been all these names that are thrown into it. Uh, but the reason why they were killed was because Tommy Uva and Rosemary Uva robbed uh four at least four that we know of mob social clubs and they took a lot of fucking money people have tried to put john Gotti jr in the mix as a shooter and that uh, there's like a dozen or so names the, the the truth of the matter is nobody really knows for certain 100 percent who did it but they got what was coming to them uh you rob mob social clubs eventually you're going to get caught and they did and they were they were executed uh as a result uh but i could do a whole entire show on tom uva this guy was a fucking di- just nut job from beginning to end. I mean, what 11-year-old kid takes a fucking burner and goes over to the gas station across the street from the house and robs him at 11 and threatens to kill him? So th- this kid had a fucking screw loose from day one, uh, wanted to be a gangster, and he pretty much tried to live it out as much as he could. Uh, but I would love to do a show on Tommy Uva just because of some of the stories that I've heard from guys that grew up with this kid and knew him. Uh, and just the, some of the, the nutty shit that he did. But yes, it's absolutely true uh, that 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 happened. Uh, how accurate the films really are is is, is one thing. Uh, but yes, absolutely happened. All right. Um, how do you think things would have panned out had Gotti killed Castellano when Della Croce was alive? Gotti would have never done it when, Cast- when, when Della Croce was alive. He couldn't. Uh, had he done that, that probably would have forced Neil's hand to do something about him. Uh, Neil was an old school guy. He believed in the boss is the boss is the boss. Uh, But I think ultimately, if if Gotti moved on Castellano with Della Croce alive, then there there probably would have been a war. Uh, I don't know necessarily if Della Croce, he loved Gotti very much. I don't know if he would have sort of moved on Gotti. Uh, I don't think he would have at the end of the day, but I think he would have seen a war. I think there would have been a big problem with that. So... You know, and also there's a good argument to make. You know, Gotti didn't have to do it. Uh, if he had just waited, you know, Castellano would have gone to prison for the fucking uh, commission case to begin with. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, we can argue it like six ways from fucking Sunday. Gotti did what he had to do. He had to do it uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and it was a power grab and it worked. All right. How close did the feds come to putting Carlo Gambino away? They never came close. Uh, were they... Using wiretaps when he was running the family, how and where would he hold his meetings? I really don't know where he would hold his meetings. I'm assuming that any meeting he needed to have took place in his home. I know for a fact he never uttered a word at these meetings. He just kind of nodded, uh, and that was the extent of it. Uh, Carlo Gambino, they were not close to putting him away ever. I think the longest he ever spent it was a couple hours in jail. That was it. Uh, Gambino didn't draw attention to himself. He didn't go out to the clubs. He didn't do these things. He lived in a very modest fucking house. He took care of his kids. He took care of his wife. And that was the bottom line. He had a nice spread out on Long Island, a summer home that he stayed at. So I think uh, the feds were never close to putting him away. The feds did everything they could to try to strangle the Gambinos, but they couldn't because Carlo was just like a fox. He, he stayed he stayed away from everything. He didn't need the fucking car. He didn't need the fucking big house. He didn't need the clothes. He just did his fucking thing. It was an old school Sicilian way of dealing with things. Uh, and they were never close to getting him. Never, never, never. All right. With the Westies, if Mickey Featherstone didn't become a rat and he went to war with Jimmy Coonan, who do you think the Gambinos 
or do you think the Gambinos would have gotten involved, or do you just think they let each other wipe wipe each other out? Uh, that's a really great question, and and the reason why I say that is because what would they do if Jimmy Coonan and, and Mickey Featherstone go to war? What could they do? First of all, I think the Gambinos would have just killed every single one of them, uh, because you can't have these guys running the street shooting at each other. It brings heat on them. Uh, it was uh, mob territory that, that the Italians owned. So if if there was a war that really and there was kind of a war that broke out between the two of them, but um, if you're talking all in all out and out war, I think the Gambinos would have just killed every single one of them. Uh, sometimes the heat was something like that. I just and even if you go back and and, and look at the Westies issues, uh, just Mad Dog Sullivan and all these crazy guys. And you look at the reality of, of how that all went down and transpired. Uh, it just, Mickey Spillane, same same kind of deal. I just don't think the Gambinos would put up with it. Uh, I don't think that they would pick one side or the other. I, I just don't think business-wise it makes sense for them to do that. And I think less is more. So I think the more focus and attention that these assholes bring to themselves creates a bigger problem for the Gambinos because they had a lot of business ties with each other. So I think ultimately at the end of the day, if that's the way it went down, I think the Gambinos would have just killed both of them and been done with it. Uh, and I think that's pretty much uh, the way that it would go down. All right. Do you think the Bananos would have been more powerful under a th- under three Capos? Uh, say Sonny Red, Dominic Trinchera, uh, Giacone versus Rusty Ristelli. Uh, Joe Messino and Sonny Black. So I guess the question is, do I think one group of three would be more powerful under another group of three? You got to look at the time period, and I don't think, listen, Sonny Black, Joey Messino, and, and Rusty Rostelli are of, of the six names that we mentioned. Uh, Dominic Trinchera, also Sonny Red, uh, and Giacone. I, I think ultimately at the end of the day, Joey Messino and Rusty Rostelli and Sonny Black were the, 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 the three tougher, the three... I think, yes, it probably would have been better if it ran under them at the time. But that's like opening a whole cavalcade of, of fucking information and a diatribe. I could go on about that. Uh, I, I think ultimately at the end of the day, when you're talking about power in general, uh, I think that power is always better when it's multiples and not one. Uh so it would be like saying, do I think a, a, a traditional mob family would be run under three directors versus one? I think it's. I think it always works. I think, listen, opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got them. But I think when you allow yourself to have a structure where it's not just your, like you could still have the final word. But I think when there's a ruling panel, things work better because now you're not dealing with one opinion. You've got several. And I think several opinions, uh, especially when it comes to advice and, and trying to, to parlay what you want to do, I think hearing all sides to it are often better. Uh, whereas if you look at a guy like Joe Bonanno, historically didn't didn't want to hear what anybody had to say. Nope, I'm doing what I want, and you know, don't get me started with that guy. But I think ultimately at the end of the day, when you have a panel, I think it's just better for business. But that's just my opinion. All right. Uh, what is the future of La Cosa Nostra? With many aging gangsters, the books at some point are going to have to open again. Where do you see Cosa Nostra in the next 10 to 15 years? Same place it is now. Uh, I think one of the unique things that is going on traditionally now uh, is a lot of mob families are going sort of a back turn. And when I say a back turn, meaning uh, specifically with the Gambinos, I think with the Sicilian faction, they're, they're sort of, it's sort of like dropping back in time. It's very interesting to see it happen. Uh, you know, today's gangster. Uh, and, and really, you look at the dichotomy of different like crime families, like the Lucchese's, the Bonanos. You look at how those factions dress. And it's so completely different. Uh, the Gambinos are uh, t-shirts and jeans, very casual wear. Uh, the Bonanos are t-shirts and jeans, very casual wear. The Lucchese's are track suits and gold necklaces. Uh, there is like a, 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 it's hard to explain. If, if you're not in the city and you're not familiar with seeing it, uh, you probably wouldn't recognize it at first. But I think the reality is that when I say they're taking a back turn is the Sicilians have this unique way of just not saying shit being very to themselves, not being out in the open publicly. Uh, they hide, so to speak. And when I say hide, I don't mean that in a negative way. <clears throat> what I mean is is that the days of the street corner social clubs are gone. There are some. There are some left, but it, it's not like it was in 1960, 1970, or even in 1980 for that matter. Uh, they have gone underground. Uh, 
Uh, there is, I, I guess, it, for those that have seen like uh, the uh, Goodfellas, you know, when when fucking Tootie is going from A to B to use a payphone and then going and delivering a message, that's sort of the way it's gone back. There's this sort of regression to go back with what worked in the old days. And that is the biggest thing that I'm saying is they're, they're sort of taking a step back. Uh, they're, they're not throwing huge mob parties where everybody attends. They're all not meeting in one place. It's, it's very secretive. And, and it's like, it's a throwback to, to, the, to the glory days. And, and I think a lot of crime families are starting to do that. Uh, almost everybody is using a front boss system now, which used to be just the Genovese's. They were really the only ones that did it. They invented it. Uh, but you're seeing all mob families do this now. So there's, there's a very much insulation and there's a lot of protection on what they do. And you're still going to see rats. You're still going to see indictments. That's never going to change, but you're never going to eradicate Cosa Nostra either. You're never going to get rid of it. Uh, people that said specifically on some of these old mob documentaries, the mob is done. The mob isn't fucking done. Uh, I think the fact that there were three, what, two fucking mob hits, in less than fucking three weeks or a month apart here, that, that should tell you something. Things are reverting back to the old ways, and I think that's fantastic. Uh, I think that as surveillance techniques change and, and wiretap laws and all this nonsense, you have to sort of evolve with that, and the mob is evolving very quickly with it. I also think that the mob sort of was given sort of a pass in terms of 9-11. When 9-11 happened, the focal point was terrorists and all of this stuff that was going on, and it gave the mob a chance to kind of catch its breath and rebuild, and that's exactly what's happened. Listen, the numbers, just take the numbers in Philadelphia, for example. There's Scarfo era numbers at this point, from what I have heard, uh, you know, and, and so when you start to see Scarfo era numbers, which I don't even know why they, well, when you, when you say that, it should tell you something. But see, the problem is, is once your numbers reach a certain point, now you catch the eye of the FBI again, and, and it all goes rolling shit rolling downhill again. And, and that's what's going to happen. But you're never going to get rid of the mafia, and I don't think it's going to change a whole lot from 10 to 15 years. But what I'm seeing now in the streets uh, is, is a revert back to the old days. Uh, the guys, are, guys, guys aren't using their cell phones in clubs. They're leaving the, the cell phones in the car, and, and they're doing their thing. So they're reverting and going back to what worked to begin with. And what works is don't be seen and don't be heard. You do those two things, don't be seen and don't be heard, you're not going to prison. And that's the reality. And if they, if the mob can, can have that mindset and say, okay, obviously with surveillance techniques and everything that they got going on now, if they can sort of take a step back in time, not go to the clubs, not buy the fucking Maserati, not buy the fucking $3 million house, and just live sort of a shadow lifestyle, which sucks. I mean, who wants to live that way? But if you do it that way, you use burner phones, you do these things, you don't end up, one, on a fucking wiretap, two, if you don't speak to people you don't know, you don't, you can't get indicted for shit that a rat wants to say. The problem is it's laziness. And I'll be honest, and I'm not like poking a hole in a, in a gangster. I'm not doing it. What I'm saying is if you just lead your life in a way where you don't talk, you don't say nothing. If you say nothing, you don't talk, you're not seen, you don't go to jail. But because of money and the way that organized crime typically works, everything's about money. So it allows you to sort of bypass somebody you don't know by listening to what they have to say. And next thing you know, you're getting fucking pinched at five o'clock in the morning. So like I said, I think that they're taking a step back. That's my opinion. I mean, I could be very wrong, but I think what I'm seeing is they're taking a step back. It's not meeting in fucking broad daylight at three o'clock in the afternoon. It's, it's two 30 in the morning at a park, just one and one guy and one guy meeting to discuss whatever they're going to discuss, cut up whatever they need to cut up. And they go about their fucking thing. When you're not seen, even if, if you're not seen, you could, you can make an argument. You don't exist. The problem is there are certain types and, and certain, arch, certain archetypes in organized crime, and I'm not speaking about anybody specifically, but there are certain archetypes that sort of like that attention. You know, they, they want to be seen. They want to be known as the tough guy. But the guys that don't go to prison the rest of their life are the tough guy that nobody knows who they are. That's the way it should be. That's what organized crime, that's what Cosa Nostra is supposed to be. But welcome to the, to the century we're in. With social media and everything else 
Uh, but the guys that are going to succeed are the guys that aren't seen. They need to be heard when they're heard. Believe me, they're heard when they need to be. But the guys that seek the, seek the fucking attention and the affection of other people like that because it does something for their ego is the wrong thing. And that, that's just the way, uh, the way it is. You know, so I so yeah, there's a big revert coming, and I think that ten to fifteen years, I don't think you're going to see much change. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna be involved in typically more scams than you could ever believe. I mean, come on, a lot of people couldn't believe that they were involved in stock fraud. They, listen, if there's a way to make a dollar, they're going to make it. Uh, so I think that as technology changes, they're going to evolve as well. Sorry, I went on a rabbit trail with that. Okay, do you think Sammy Gravano will meet the same fate as Whitey Bulger? God, I hope so. You want to talk Christmas time in fucking New York 24-7? Samuel Gavano gets anything like Whitey gets. There's going to be a celebration in New York, let me tell you. That guy's a prick. Bald-headed, ugly fucking prick. Uh, and I know who asked this question. I think it was Joy. Joy Ferracci, whose brother was killed by Sammy Gravano. Uh, Alan Kaiser, young kid, shot for no fucking reason, left for dead on the side of the road. For no fucking reason. Mistaken identity. You don't hear Karen Gravano talk about that. You don't hear Sammy the Bull talk about that. Uh, they're, they're just scumbags. The whole family is nothing but trash and garbage. Uh, so let's hope that he does meet the same fate as Whitey Bulger. That would be fantastic. That would make my fucking year. All right. Why did New York allow Mickey Cohen to take over Los Angeles after Benny Siegel was killed? Why didn't they support Jack Dragna in the war with Cohen? Very, very simple answer to this because Cohen controlled the fucking movie industry. Cohen controlled so much money in L.A. that the mob was definitely going to side. First of all, Mickey Cohen was fucking ruthless. Mickey Cohen was a straight fucking gangster more than Jack Dragna could have ever fucking been. Uh, but it was because Cohen controlled the studios, the mob got huge kickbacks out of that. Uh, Jack Dragna was a tough guy, yes, but he didn't have the money and the power like fucking Mickey Cohen did. They backed him because of because of the studios. There was too much money for the mob to 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 ignore. They couldn't ignore that amount of money, so they went with Cohen instead. Uh, and that's the very simple answer. Okay, top five mob bosses of all time, in your opinion? Uh, for me, Carlo Gambino, Tommy Lucchese, Russell Buffalino, Santo Traficante, and Ray Patriarca. Those are my top five. Uh, I wanted to include the chin, but I had to pick five, and those are my five. Uh, chin is a close five point five and a half for me, but once again, it's Gambino, Lucchese, Buffalino, Traficante, and Ray Patriarca. All right. Uh, oh, this is a great one. Any chance John Connolly can get transferred to Hazleton? If there is a God, that's what will happen. Uh, <laughs> that's a pretty good one. All right. Do you think Toto Rina and the Palermo Mafia was – more powerful than the American Mafia families in New York? Yes and no. Uh, Andrangheta by, and the Sicilian Mafia is absolutely fucking huge in, in Italy. Uh, I've, I've talked about it before. Just these people kill politicians in, in Italy. They don't fuck around. Uh, big difference. Are they more powerful? In a sense, they are because they can kill politicians and get away with it. Uh, but... See, that's where that's where the line gets a little drawn to me, because if you can kill a politician and a judge and get away with it, for the most part, you're pretty fucking powerful. Uh, the numbers just Andrangheta and, and just Camorra and all these other groups over there uh, worldwide, they're just not there. They're in Germany, France, uh, Spain, fucking Afghanistan, uh, the Arab Emirates. They're, they're everywhere. So uh, are they more powerful in a sense? I mean, I don't think uh, see, that's a real tough question because they almost, in a sense, they are. In a sense, they are. They're more powerful from the the, the fact that they could take out police and politicians and not not fucking lose a, an ounce of sleep over it. Uh, the American Mafia could never do that. But I also don't think that Totorina could make a phone call and make anybody in, shake in their boots in, in the United States. I, so I think that the best way to answer that is I think that Totorina... In Italy was the fucking man, obviously. Uh, I think he could do all kinds of things, but I don't think he's the kind of guy that could pick up the phone and, and make a mob boss here do anything. I think that they had mutual power on different uh, different planes of existence. Uh, but I think ultimately, at the end of the day, if you could have a fucking cop or a politician fucking whacked and just laugh about it and not worry about it, that makes you pretty tough and strong. 
All right. Um, of all of the American mafia guys that are alive today, who would you say is the most respected? Probably Sonny Francis, because this guy is 101 fucking years old. Uh, is a fucking legend in the streets. I don't think anybody, even at 101, would talk nonsense to that guy. Uh, I think if you believe the papers, I think Barney Balomo is a seriously respected guy uh, for a lot of different reasons. But I think really if I had to pick like an older guy, I, I think Sonny Francis by far uh, is probably one of the most respected old timers. Uh, come on, he's 101. Can you imagine sitting down and, and talking to him? Some of the fucking stories he could tell you, but he never will because he's an old school gangster. Uh, all right. Who are you voting for? Wow. All right, I don't get into politics, so who I vote for really doesn't matter. Uh, but if I had to vote for anybody, I'm voting Joey Merlino. Let's vote for Joey Merlino to be, uh, I guess, president. Is that, I guess, this is what you're asking me? Uh, listen, I don't get into politics. There's a good reason why. But uh, we're going to vote for Joey Merlino. That's who we'll vote for. Or, you know what, we'll vote for Angelo Lutz. Maybe we can vote for him. Uh, maybe have like a Joey Merlino, Angela Lutz uh, candidacy. Maybe one runs for president, one runs for VP. We could have a whole entire conglomerate of Philadelphia wise guys. We can vote them all in. Wouldn't that be something? Be Philly cheesesteaks every day for fucking eight years. That would be perfect. All right, so those are all the questions. Uh, once again, I wanted to thank everybody who does participate in this. Uh, you make it very easy uh, and fun to do. Uh, and more. And we listen, we, we try to do these Q&A things all the time because, I mean, very rarely do I get the same question over and over and over and over. But but oftentimes that I do, uh, I still answer them anyway. Uh, you can submit your questions for the Q&A uh, on Twitter at RealMobTalk7. Uh, either tweet them to me or put them in my inbox or you can go over on Facebook, type in Mob Talk Radio, just message me. Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of like, listen, there's a lot of questions that I get nonstop, like 24 hours a day. And I can't really, uh, individually answer all of them. I, I just can't physically do it. It's just too much. Uh, but I try to as much as I can. So if I answer, uh, a question and it's like three or four words long, it's, it's not that I'm not trying to answer it, but I'm trying to be as brief as I can and get to the point because I've got three other 359 or whatever it is, other questions I got to get to. Uh, I try to individually answer everybody as much as I can, even the personal questions. People ask me personal stuff all the time, uh, and I will answer anything. I'm not going to hide, and I'm very personable. Uh, but once we move towards the new site, there's going to be a little less of that, only because I can't physically <laughs> sit on my fucking phone while I'm on the train going somewhere to, to have a meeting, and there's like six questions. Ah, oh, fuck, let me answer these. So I, I just I can't do it. It's It's the sheer volume of it. Uh, but what we're going to start doing is live Q&As. Those are going to be kind of fun. Uh, and we're sort of uh, trying to figure out how we're going to do that as we speak. Uh, I'm going to try to do them when Scott comes over to this country uh, in January. We're going to do like a live Q&A. We're going to do live hangout stuff too. Uh, but also take into consideration that, you know, I, I, I still, uh, how to say this? Uh, there are certain things that I can't answer. I can't answer. And the reason being is because I, I may know somebody you're talking about and I'm not going to, you know, put their name out there. I'm not going to put their business out there. That's not what I do. Uh, there have been people that have messaged me about an infamous rat. I can't legally answer those questions, so I won't. Uh, and that's just the reality of it. But here's what we're going to do. Uh, give us a like, give us a subscribe, uh, follow us on YouTube mob talk radio uh tons of videos and stuff out there follow us on twitter even if you hate us go ahead and follow us anyway that way you can follow me and, and send you death threats and etc uh we're going to take a break and when we come back we are going to talk not in depth uh but we're going to talk about what happened to whitey bulger uh why it happened uh not necessarily who did it because i don't want to make that the focal point uh because i do have a big biographical show that's coming out on him and that'll probably be in the next three weeks uh, it's going to be huge, like a two and a half hour show. But I just wanted to talk about Whitey Bulger and what happened uh, and sort of dispel some of the rumors. So stay tuned right here on Mop Talk Radio. We'll be back and we will wrap it up with some Whitey Bulger news. Stay tuned. In my travels, I'm always looking for a clothing brand that I feel like represents me. Anybody can go to a store and buy a t-shirt with a gimmick. But if you believe in three core values like I do, loyalty, honor, and respect, then look no further than Omerta brand clothing you can catch them at omertamia.com o-m-e-r-t-a 
MIA.com with locations in Europe, California, Boston, Brooklyn, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Washington. They have a great clothing line with hats, shirts, sweatshirts, keychains, anything you might need, stickers. You want the rats to stop snitching? Go right out and get yourself a sticker. But if you want to live your life by the gentleman's code, look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. We are going to now talk about Whitey Bulger and what happened to him. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, Whitey Bulger was transferred from prison in Florida to Hazleton, West Virginia, which is no fucking joke. Uh, for some reason, he was put in general, excuse me, general population, and he was pretty much slocked to death by three inmates, uh, two of which uh, have ties to Springfield uh, and to the mob. Uh, one was a former mob hitman, uh, and that's pretty much the way it, it, it rolls. Uh, one of the things that people are talking about, and, and they have some validity when they when they bring this up, is how is it that somebody that is a top informant like Whitey Bulger, how how is it that this guy was killed and nobody knew what was going on? Uh, in that of uh, in that little spectrum. There is a lot of validity in people saying there's no way that prison guards didn't know what was going on. Uh, there's no way that uh, somebody didn't know something. And, and I agree with that. I think the people that are saying the FBI wanted him dead and that's why they did this, it, that's nonsense. Uh, I don't buy into that. Uh, especially it, it, the reason why is there's a million other ways they could have gotten Whitey Bulger. They didn't have to do it that way if, if the FBI was in some sort of collusion act to, to kill Bulger. Uh, the bigger question here I think that people need to ask is why the fuck Whitey Bulger was put in general population. And that's what leads people to, to blame in the FBI. Uh, a lot of people dropped the ball for a lot of different reasons. Now, why was he transferred to begin with? Well, one, he was repeatedly jerking off in front of other inmates – uh, he threatened a nurse at the Florida prison, uh, so he was in the hole a lot there. Uh, he was also snitching on the other inmates there, and they were going to move him to a medical facility. What they did was they moved him to Oklahoma. He got some medical treatment. He was cleared to go, and then they sent him to Hazleton. Uh, the question that I would have is why do you send somebody like Weddy Bulger into Hazleton? Uh, they offered him protective custody. He refused it. Uh, and so he was in Gen Pop when he got attacked and was killed. Uh, I A lot of people have said to me, well, I, you know, how is it that people even knew he was there? He had only been there 24 hours. Very simple. In the prison system, and this is the way it works for pedophiles, wife beaters, and rapists. When you arrive in prison, if you're that type of person, if you're a rat, a wife beater, a wife murderer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, pedophile, what happens is the hacks, the guards basically have your jacket they know what you're accused of what you're convicted of they have details of that and really when you get into prison you know they they got to figure out where they're going to segregate you what what wing you're going to be on because they don't want to put you with these types of people those types of people uh, they look at your tattoos to see if you're a gang affiliate who you're affiliate of and then they try to put you in a section so that there won't be a problem uh, in this specific case i believe that the guards are the ones who pretty much put it out in the yard that Whitey Bulger was coming. They knew Whitey Bulger was coming before Whitey Bulger knew he was coming. That's the truth. That's what I honestly believe. Uh, whether or not the guards turned a blind eye, I think it's highly suspect only because, look at the situation. Whitey Bulger's 89, wheelchair bound, sitting in his fucking cell. Three guys, mob guys, go in to the cell for like two and a half minutes, come out, then they wrap Whitey in the bed and just leave him there. Uh, the fact that... I, I think what, what should come out, what needs to come out is, what was the delay? Nobody seems to know what the, 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 the delay was between how long these guys went in and how long before they found Whitey's body. From what, I've under, from what I'm hearing, it was a couple hours. Uh, and I just don't understand how a couple hours goes by. And you kind of just don't notice nothing. So can we be conspiratorial in the sense that we can believe the guards were in on it? Absolutely. I would have no time, no no problem buying that information. I think that that's probably more accurate. Uh, but to believe the FBI was in on it, I, I, that I don't buy. Uh, that I don't buy. However, the one thing that can sort of, uh, sort of twist that idea is the fact that they put them in Hazleton. Uh, the fact that they, if 
if Bulger was not so goddamn high profile, uh, then this would just would pass the smell test. Uh, but it doesn't pass the smell test because of how I, you know, how high profile he was to begin with. Uh, you just don't put a guy like that in a prison like that, full well knowing you got some mobsters in there. You know what's going to happen. You fully know what's going to happen. So somebody, you know, I think they dropped the ball all up and down the line. But at the end of the day, I don't give a fuck. I don't really care. I don't, I, to me, justice was handled. Justice was handled a street way, the way it should have been handled years ago. Uh, the So for anybody to, you know, start screaming foul and wants to blame the FBI, who gives a fuck? The guy got killed because he was a rat. He put a lot of people, he strangled a fucking woman. He put nothing but fucking heroin and all kinds of drugs into Southie, destroying Southie. So there's a lot of things that this guy did that were going to come back to haunt him. I'm just surprised it took so long as it did. But I don't feel bad for him. Uh, one instant. I don't feel anything. Uh, when the news came out and I heard that, I went, huh, oh, it's a good day. Uh, Whitey just was not, how to say this? Whitey just was not just a fucking gangster. He was a scumbag in every sense of the imagination. Look, we could talk, because we specifically talk about the mafia on my show, and we specifically talk about organized crime. Whitey Bulger was an organized crime guy. How many organized crime guys, excuse me, can you name that killed women, strangled women? How many people? Do you know Whitey Bulger also had a rape charge that went back to the days of Alcatraz for raping a woman? A lot of people don't know that. They don't talk about that. But this is not your average organized crime guy's criminal acts. They're not rapists. They don't hurt kids. They don't fucking beat women and kill women. This guy did. So he had what was coming to him. And one of the things that I, I saw online right after this happened was people <coughs> repeatedly saying, oh, I feel so bad. He's an 89-year-old man. How could anybody hurt an old man? And it's like, do you know who the fuck you're even talking about? It's like, it, it's the strangest thing, this social media bullshit. Everybody and their mother will fucking praise and be loyal and talk so good about rats. And they don't understand that these guys, whatever they've done in their criminal life is one thing, but then they tell on everybody else because they don't want to do time. Now, I said earlier that I was going to bring up the 302s and John Connolly, and that's very important because if you watch the film, The United States of America versus Whitey Bulger, it used to be on Netflix. I think you could probably catch it on YouTube now. Uh, there is a, I don't want to say valid, but there is an argument that Whitey Bulger essentially used John Connolly to keep him out on the streets. He fed John Connolly a bunch of shit, a bunch of garbage, a bunch of dirt. It never amounted to much. And that allowed Bulger to just keep being active and not go to jail. But my thing is, is like in all the years, Kevin Weeks, John Motorano, the Angelo brothers, everybody that was around this guy, did, did they not start to wonder why Whitey wasn't arrested and half of them were? Did it ever cross their fucking minds? Uh, so where do I believe? Where do I stand with it? Where I stand with it is I think John Connolly was fucking complicit in murders. He was complicit in half the crimes Bulger did. He tipped Bulger off, which is why Bulger was able to flee the country so quick. Uh, John Connolly is a fucking criminal. I don't think for one second that Whitey didn't rat people out. The difference is, and it's not even a difference, Whitey just didn't testify. Whitey didn't testify, but he provided information for 40 fucking years. We're not talking about one, two things. We're talking about a lifetime of ratting people out, putting charges on them. And in turn, what he got, his reward, was free reign to murder, to sell drugs, and to do whatever he wanted. So for anybody to tell me that this guy was a fucking saint, that this guy is somebody who should be fucking revered, for somebody to tell me he ran the mafia in, in New England, you're out of your fucking mind. You're out of your fucking mind. Whitey Bulger got exactly what was coming to him. And I wish, I, this is an awful thing for me to say. And I'll take shit for it, but I don't care. I wish this happened to every single one of these motherfuckers that does this. Sammy Gravano, fucking John Vesey, fucking that fat fuck Ron Pravity. 
Ron Previty, kill that fucker. He's dead now. Anyway, but kill that fucker too. John Moderano, put two in his head. Put two in Kevin Weeks' head. If you do that, I have said on this show repeatedly, and this is in terms of the street. This isn't a political statement. This is just in terms of the street. The minute the mob stopped killing people, they lost power. The minute you lose politics and you lose the, the fear or the threat of fear, you lose it because then nobody's going to fear you. So what you have in a situation like this is Bulger finally gets his. Sammy Gravano needs to get his next. Stevie Flemmy. All these fucking jerk-offs. They, if the mob does that and they kill these guys, all of a sudden you're going to see a lot of different things change. Because now it's not, well, we may beat you up. Now it's, we will fucking kill you. And that's the way it was since the beginning of time with the mafia. But the minute you lose that violent edge or the minute that a guy knows... All right, they may beat me up, but they won't kill me. Nobody kills anybody anymore. The minute that you lose that power over somebody, then what's the ramifications if somebody doesn't want to pay the vig? He gets beat up. Okay. Then the guy just runs to the cops anyway and tells. So I think the theory here in terms of Whitey Bulger is that he was a rat. That's guaranteed. But if you watch that show, The United States of America versus Whitey Bulger, it's filmed in a way that throws caution to the wind and it sort of makes you think outside the box of, gee, maybe Whitey wasn't a rat. But the reality is, he he was. He was an absolute rat. Uh, his 302s were definitely highly suspect. And, and that's the other thing that the FBI should have caught on to very quickly. Uh, especially Connolly, because there's oversight. If you look at a 302, there's the facts that it's signed, it's dated by this agent, that agent, another agent signs off on it. You look at these things, it's one fucking sentence about a crime that doesn't even make any sense so what i think happened was i think bulger at some point at some point stopped saying shit about people for the most part i mean he was still ratting but i don't think it was as significant as say his early years and i think what conley was doing was fudging the 302s making shit up so that whitey could stay out on the streets and continue to do what he was doing uh, so, and, and, and realistically speaking, that is what happened in, in a large part of this. But you can't say, you can't take, you know, uh, the last 10 years or the last eight years that he was uh, an active informant and sort of say, well, he really wasn't saying that much. So you can't make that argument because for the, for the other 34 years, he was ratting out guys left and right. You know, this guy got away with like murders in broad daylight. So... For anybody that says to me, Whitey Bulger, and there's one, there was one guy that was on, uh, uh, over on Mob Talk on Facebook. Oh, Whitey Bulger was never a rat. Like, are you, okay, fine. You want to sit there and just keep screaming he wasn't a rat? Okay, he murdered a woman. He raped a woman. What do you have to say to that? And they say nothing after that. This guy was a fucking animal. He got what was coming to him. Uh, and, and that's the end of it. This is This is what should happen. And I know that there are people that, aren't going to align with me on that and people that aren't going to agree with that statement. But he got what was coming to him. You can only do so much shit before karma comes back and spits in your face. And in this case, he was slocked 70 fucking times in like two minutes. Eyes cut out, tongue cut out, whatever the fuck. He got what was coming to him. He's left a bloody fucking mess. Uh, and, and that's it. And that's it. That's what happens to people that do this. People forget all the shit he did to other people. You know, street shit is street shit. When you kill a woman, that's a whole another fucking thing. That is, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not mafia. That's not, that, that's just not the way things operate. You kill an innocent civilian, you should die. You, you fucking touch a woman or a child, you should fucking die. That's the reality. That's the way it's always been. It hasn't always been carried out that way. But that's the way that it should be. So I don't feel bad for him. So these people that are like, you know, wearing Whitey Bulger shirts now and, and putting his picture up, rest in peace, and oh, you're a saint, and all of this shit, and that, it's like ridiculous. You don't know who the guy was, you don't know anything about him, you just read your press clippings, you think because, you know, there's a name and a face, he was this super, super, super tough guy, and he was in his young days, but the reality is he was a rat. So anybody that comes at me and makes the argument that he wasn't an informant, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about, uh... And in fact, I think it was Howie Carr that wrote a book on Whitey Bulger. You should read that book or check out Howie Carr. He's a, he's a journalist uh, and a radio guy in uh, Boston. 
And he really hates Whitey Bulger. Uh, but then there's the question of, you know, Kevin Weeks. And, and I talked about it a little bit. Listen, it, it, I can't make it any more clear. When you get into a criminal conspiracy, whatever it is, if five of your friends decide they're going to rob a bank and you go along for the ride, everybody gets caught, you don't want to do time, so you snitch on them. That's a rat. Uh, in Kevin Weeks' case, Whitey Bulger, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, Whitey Bulger really didn't say a whole lot about Kevin Weeks. Kevin Weeks got caught, not just because of Whitey Bulger, but for a lot of other reasons. Wasn't just Bulger, you know. Was, you know, look at the uh, fucking Frank Salemi, for Christ's sakes. Stevie Flemmy. All of these guys are rats. Every single one of them, they all flipped on each other. And so in Kevin Weeks' case, he doesn't get a pass. Why would he get a pass? Because he got ratted on. Well, he tattled on me first, so it makes it right. It doesn't make it right. You, nobody put a gun to Kevin Weeks' head or John Monterano's head and made them do anything. They chose of their free will to do that shit. And then because they get in trouble, they're going to they're gonna turn around and do it too to other people? That's not right. That's, that's my argument. So the people making the argument to me that Kevin Weeks isn't a rat, that's why I say he is. Two wrongs don't make a fucking right. Two wrongs don't make a fucking right. Kevin Weeks just didn't want to do prison time. That's what that is. Now, he can sit and do his little speech, and he can talk on interviews, and he can say, you know, I would have never done this. Whitey broke my heart. He's a rat scumbag. Well, but so are you. You did the same thing. And I get it. Oh, I was going to get a life sentence, and it's bullshit, and that's exactly why he did it. Don't believe for a second it's because it's street justice. Street justice is getting a gun and blowing his head off. That's street justice. Street justice isn't tattling on somebody. That's, that's, that, all that is is you're trying to minimize. You're trying to fucking minimize your punishment. That's all that's ever been about because you don't want to do jail time. That's why Kevin Weeks did it. it. wasn't because the streets were no longer loyal to him. He didn't want to go to prison. Because guess what? You know how many people in the history, in the history of organized crime, have had somebody do that to them and they say nothing. They take their medicine like a man and they go to prison and they say nothing. That's what a man does. That's what a man does. A man is not somebody who sits on a fucking stand and points the finger at somebody else because they don't want to do time. That's a gutless coward fucking move. And I'm sure some, some shithead is going to fucking give this to Kevin Weeks. And I'm sure he's going to have something to say and he can say whatever he wants to me. Uh, but the reality is, is that I don't respect what he did. I would have respected him a lot more if he got a pistol and shot him. Because he was meeting with Whitey after all of this shit. He was meeting with Whitey for years after Whitey went on the lam. And it never passed Kevin Weeks' fucking mind that, that Whitey was talking. Guy never did time. He never got caught. Everybody else did. And he like doesn't, either he knew Whitey was a fucking rat and did nothing about it. Or he really truly didn't fucking know. But the reality is, is like at some point you're in a huge crew and he's the guy that's the boss and everybody around you is getting arrested, but not him. Like, it just doesn't make sense. And so for him to sort of get on his pulpit now and be like, oh, you know, he stabbed me in the back. He broke my heart. So I did. No, you did what you did because you didn't want to do jail time. If he just came out and said, why, you know, if he just came out publicly and said, I didn't want to do prison time. That's exactly why I did what I did. I might have a little more respect for him. He's still going to be a rat. But he can't even be honest about that. He tries to spin it into this whole, there was betrayal and, and Whitey fucking betrayed me. And I, that's it. I said, that's it. That's enough. Blah, 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 blah. You had no problem killing this, killing guys on, on Whitey's orders. John Monterano had no problem killing like fucking 14, 19, 20, however fucking many guys it was. And so the idea here that, that Kevin Weeks isn't a rat is bullshit to me. The, it, it, it just, I don't understand how people, how they can, can sort of conceptualize this and put it in a, a framework of Kevin Weeks did nothing wrong. Because he did. John Monterano, he wouldn't even call himself a rat. I am a government, uh, what did he say? I am a government uh, witness. You're a fucking rat. You're a rat. They asked John Monterano. Did because he he was longtime friends with Ed Bradley. They went to school together. 
high school together. And they asked Johnny Motorano, they says, do you have any regrets about killing 14 people? No. Just as simple as that. No. Would you do it again? Yeah. But yet he can't call himself a rat. Murder, mur- and this is, this is my thing. For all of you that are saying this stuff, he could kill like it was nothing. Not even a bother to him. But you can't call him a rat. He's a government witness. You're a fucking rat. Bottom line, they destroyed fucking Boston. They fucking destroyed Providence with their nonsense. And so here we are. Whitey Bulger's dead. Uh, They had a funeral the other day. He got a Catholic fucking funeral, which is disturbing. Uh, I'm Catholic myself, and I know there have been other gangsters that were not nearly as fucking disturbing as this guy who the church refused to give funeral services for, but that's probably because of his brother being a former, what, U.S. senator or whatever. That's probably it. But it's, it's, at the end of the day, you know, I've said it a million times, if you live by a street code, the streets are either going to put you in prison or they're going to kill you. There isn't like this whole fantasy merry-go-round bullshit where you buy a fucking big house on the beach in L.A. and retire. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. In the old days, sure, there were there were several guys that, that were able to do this for 30 years and pretty much get away with it. But the reality is, is Whitey Bulger was an informant for, for, for almost 40 years, ratted on everybody, then Kevin Weeks rats on everybody, and they destroyed themselves. And so that's that's that. He Silent justice. It's justice. Whether you like it or not, it's justice. And, and there was not a tear shed for Whitey Bulger in Boston. Not like the fucking alligator fucking tears that I'm seeing all over social media. Oh, poor Whitey. Fuck Whitey. Got what was coming to him. Got what was coming to him. So, this is what we're going to do moving forward. Uh, I think next week we're going to go back to a Q&A, obviously, and we're going to obviously have another topic. I think in two weeks we're going to do a whole entire two and a half hour Whitey Bulger show. There will not be a Q and A with that. If there, if it is a Q and A, it will only be about Whitey Bulger. So it will be Whitey Bulger only questions, uh, and that's going to be over a two hour show, and that's going to be chronological from beginning to fucking end. Uh, and we'll do that. Uh, and I think that's pretty much it. I wanted to thank for everybody for like being patient the last week while I was in Rhode Island doing my thing. Uh, and hopefully moving forward, uh, you know, we can do a couple of uh, different little things. And, and I think you guys are going to be excited and, and enjoy what we got in store. But it's just a matter of timing and it's just a matter of getting it all together. Uh, but that, like I said, the, the closer we get to like, I'm like eyeing December 15th sort of like to start putting out exactly what this is all going to be. Like a nice little package so people will understand what's going on. Uh, but as far as YouTube goes... I don't think I'm going to be on YouTube a lot longer uh, past, you know, January. Like I said, once we launch on the new site, uh, all the old stuff will remain on YouTube. And a lot of people told me, well, you're going to lose part of your base. I I really don't give a shit. The the, the point is, is that uh, the crap that happened on YouTube, and I don't want to get involved in it and, and, and talk about it here. It's just not the platform for it. But there was some shady shit that went on. I think either Anastasia was involved or somebody else was involved, but... Uh, let's just say that there's an argument over uh, my radio show's name, Mob Talk Radio, which I have owned. Uh, some shitbag uh, pretty much laid claim to the name, and I think it's Anastasia. I can't prove it, but that's that's what I seem to think. Uh, and that's typically a cowardly fucking thing that him and that little, that little cunt uh, fucking Dave Ratweiser would do. But I can't prove it, but that's sort of where I think it's going. Uh, and that's fine. They're entitled to say that they own that name if they want because they're garbage pails, both of them, jerk-offs. So that's why I'm going to leave YouTube because I'm just not going to I'm not gonna put up with that nonsense. I think it's ridiculous. Uh, I think what I do is very different than what they do. I mean, it's similar in a sense, but it's very different. But, but if they're going to be cowardly like that and they're going to fucking lay claim to something that doesn't belong to them, then... You know, it is what it is, and I'm not going to fight with him over it. It's just pointless. Uh, I got a, I got a different little surprise for that piece of shit Anastasia coming soon. Uh, but uh, I guess all being said, we once we open the new website, things will be a lot different. Uh, total interaction. There's going to be so much going on on this, this page. Uh, 
you know, and, and people are messaging me daily saying, when can I join? When can I join? Well, it's not even, it's, it's not ready yet. Uh, so the closer we get, I, like I said, I think around December 15th and December 16th, I think we're going to like sort of unleash what exactly this page is going to be. And those who want to join can absolutely join. Those who don't want to, I totally understand it and I can appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for at least riding it out this long with me. But I think, uh, I think that what we're going to do is going to rival anything you've ever seen uh, mafia coverage wise uh from the angle that that i take it uh and i got a lot of good guests that are coming but like i said i want to hold them off until i have the site up and running because i think that that's giving people something uh any but listen anybody can write articles anybody can post radio shows uh not everybody can do that but it's a fairly simple task that that you could really do but where we're taking this is going to be something like you've never seen. So just hang in there with me. Uh, for those that continue on, thank you. For those that don't, I appreciate you uh, supporting me up to this point anyway. Uh, so all that being said, go over onto Twitter. Give us a follow at Real Mob Talk 7. Uh, we're also on Instagram, Mob Talk Radio, which somebody tried to start a fake one of those. Uh, these people are lunatics and jerk offs and nut jobs. Uh, Check us out on Facebook, Mob Talk Radio. Give a like, subscribe, or whatever the fuck that that does. Uh, send your death threats, your complaints, your grievances to the usual places. Uh, all that being said, I look forward to talking to everybody next week. Uh, and just do me a solid. Just share the show. That's all we ever ask. Just share. Uh, all that being said, have a great weekend, everybody. And we will see everyone back next week. Check Mob Talk Radio over on Twitter, uh, at Real Mob Talk 7, and over on Facebook, Mob Talk Radio, to see updates about questions to see updates about whitey bulger uh i post i post a lot of polls and stuff like that every once in a while so you know be interactive with with the facebook page be interactive with twitter you're gonna you know that way you're not lost in translation tra, uh, excuse me transition because a lot of people uh will ask me like even up till today what's the show on this week if you just go over to twitter and you follow along or you go over to instagram or you go over to facebook then you'll you'll not be out of the loop whatsoever so all that being said, we'll see everybody next week.